My name is Michael Romanowski uh, from Coast Mastering in Berkeley, California, but I'm here at Sweetwater Studios in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and I'm mixing the uh, to-be-named uh, forthcoming Kenny Wayne Shepherd album in Dolby Atmos. It's always interesting to go to a different place, different perspective, different rooms, you know, and one of the things about, uh, certainly about music, and as a mastering engineer, um, first and foremost as well, or worked my way to that, is understanding translatability. And one of the things about translatability is knowing different rooms, knowing how things sound. And it's always interesting for me to come to a new place, get a, a handle on the sound, how it presents itself, what the room is like, what the speakers are like, what the converters are like, and just be in a different space to experience uh, in a different in a different realm and so it's always educational and always uh, insightful for me to be somewhere else and hear how things translate and what they sound like in as many different rooms as possible so it's a pleasure to be here and and uh, get accustomed to this room well Dolby Atmos at a at a high level uh, is is it a an immersive format it's one of the many different immersive audio formats available to the consumers at the moment I'm sure there are more to come as things uh, always uh, evolve in different ways but it's uh, it's a, it's an, uh, a bed and object based uh, spatial audio. So it's a way of creating a three dimensional experience of the artist's intent with, with their records, with their music. It's a way of, as I would say, um, painting the room rather than necessarily painting the front wall. You know, we're thinking about speakers in a left right position and trying to think about all this information that comes out of left and right. But we experience sound, music, and sound around the world, you know, our day-to-day -day living in a three-dimensional space. This is a way of taking music back to that. When you go to a show, when you hear a, 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 you know, somebody playing piano in a room, when you hear any kind of sound, we're sitting here listening to the reflections of the room and the sense of space that the music is happening in. This is Dolby's version, the creation of how to, cr how to take that music, how to take those pieces and parts or that experience and bring it to a recorded and then distributed format. So it's a way of being able to uh, bring the listener back more to reality, how we experience sound uh, throughout, our, throughout our daily life. The difference between immersive audio and stereo audio, in thinking about stereo, the paradigm that we've been under for you know, decades, is trying to think about two speakers, originally three speakers, because there was a center channel, but looking at two speakers as a left and right, um, all of the aspects of the music, the performance, the recording, the mixing, um, the balance, because engineers used to be called balance engineers, so the whole balance of what comes forth, what grabs the listener's attention, what's the most important piece, whether it's a melody line or a particular instrument, all has had to be fit into this uh, two-dimensional or this, this two-speaker playback system. And consequently, uh, a composition has been that way too, thinking about how do you write parts as a, as a creative person? How do you arrange the song? How do you arrange the song and the parts so they get the meaning across well, the artist's intent, the heart, the message, the lyrics, the whatever it is that the emotion that grabs people as a listener, how do you get that out of two channels? We've been, that's what we've been working on for so long now. Immersive audio has been around in a number of formats for a long time, just sort of way under the radar for most people and not really commercially accessible to the masses. And with Dolby Atmos and other formats um, and distribution platforms like Apple Music and Amazon and Tidal and, and a whole bunch of others as well, we're, we're now finding a way to get it out to the masses. And I think what that's really done, there's, there's been a way to maybe reimagine and how these records that have been made coming out of this two-channel system, how they fit, how pieces have fit together and what can be done with them. Sometimes you don't want to pull them apart. You need to leave them together because it's, you know, uh, things are greater than the sum of the parts. However, there's also opportunities for creating that sense of space I was talking about by giving the listener a little more insight into what's happening. And what I'm really excited about is when we get past the, I don't want to say toddler stage, but as we're getting through this and people are figuring out what this is and how to best recreate the artist's intent, now part writing and arrangements and sonics, different, different ranges of, of frequencies, different dynamics. You know, classical music has dynamics written into it as part of the, you know, that's part of the composition. The, the, the idea of a sense of space in, now that we're opening things up in an immersive world, 
also allows a closer integration for the listener into a sense of space as far as a composition goes. I'm anxious to see what happens when people start writing music even more so in this realm rather than, than adapting what they already have. It's a great insight for folks to hear, especially fans of records, to, to listen into, into the music more than they've been able to. But I think that's only the first step. I think when we start getting past that step of, okay, cool, this is what this is and this is how this can be, we also will now get to a spot where this is now what I can create and this is what I can imagine. And when people start getting into really that as a primary, not secondary aspect of, of making music, creating art, um, I think it's gonna be fascinating. I'm really anxious to see where, where this goes. One of the things I've found uh, working on a, a tremendous variety of styles of music coming from different places, different engineers, different artists, and different creative paths is um, there aren't, I mean, there are no real, I mean, there are deliverable standards, but there are no real sort of best, there are no standards for what we're doing or how we're doing it. It's all being developed. You know, when stereo became a thing, when we went from mono to stereo, you know, originally, People were just taking the panning knob and going like this because they could. Whether that was the right thing to do or not, you know, who knows? Did it serve the music is the biggest, is the biggest question. You know, you can listen to something like, you know, Hendrix, like Are You Experienced on speakers and there's this cool sort of, you know, psychedelic back and forth weirdness to it, but you put it on headphones and it's kind of nauseating. You know, people are like, okay, cool. Or the, the Beatles, you know, having, having such amazing work done to get all of those sounds to come out of one speaker and then saying, okay, cool, well, we'll just do a stereo thing on the side and we'll pan things and then the drums and bass are over here and other things are over there and everybody's, oh my God, that's amazing, it's amazing. Like they, they were just figuring it out, you know? And we're all just sort of wandering around figuring that out. So as far as placement of music, I mean, thinking about where the channels go, I, I think it's, you know, first and foremost, serve the artist, serve the song, serve the music. Then all the tools that we have are all just ways of doing that, whether it's in any production, the right mic at the right place or the right EQ, or if it needs it or not, if it doesn't need it, or compression, if it does or doesn't need it. And, you know, it's choosing the tools that, that work and serve the music. And the format's kind of the same thing. Choose the format, and if it's immersive, then there's, you know, then use that as a tool to express the artist's intent. One of the things I've found, you know, now there's a whole list to so you say, like, as the question of, of uh, standards, and as the old joke goes, the nice thing about standards is that there are plenty of them to choose from. But we're not looking at necessarily standards, but best practices. And so thinking about best practices, one of the things I've found is the, the better presented material the more easily accepted or digestible or comprehended by the listener are things that go back further than the stems. I find that a lot of times, you know, in, in stereo production, folks are trying to get as much information, very dense in a lot of cases, coming out of two channels. And you've got to find ways to make information pop out of only two channels when there's a whole lot of other stuff going on. We don't need to do that in this world. We don't need to squeeze all of that into this, this particular, you know, trying to come out of just these two, these two speakers. One of the things I find is that when people are finishing their stereo records, you ask as a best practice thing, but for me, best practice is to go back to the original files, the original recorded parts, not the mixed down stems, because they have baked into them lots of things that will box you in in an immersive setup. For example, a lot of compression. One of the things about immersive audio is that there is a sense of space and again, transience and dynamics, and you're not trying to get things to come out of, you know, trying to you know, fight for attention out of a singular or, or dual speaker system. You've got a sense of space to be able to work where things can breathe. You know, I go back to the Beatles and say, for example, like Sgt. Pepper, all the amazing work that was done to get the piano and the guitar and vocals and all those things to sound like themselves within this mono playback system, that piano and that guitar and that those things don't sound like them if you just move them around. Take that and move it over here and it's like, well, that so sort of sounds like a piano and that's kind of a guitar, but in this realm it works because you're not stepping on each other's toes, but you don't have toes to step on when you move things around. You've got the space to quote Homer Simpson, embiggen, do you want an embiggen sound? Do you want the instrument to feel real as what's going on over here? 
uh, in different places, whether it's up, down, around, and behind you. And so locking oneself into a position that is, you know, transience and dynamics uh, compromised, it may work for the stereo, and I'm not, I'm not being judgmental on that. I'm, that's, that's what needs to happen, it does. But I, I think that we have an opportunity to bring people in more when it can be brought, it can be more expansive. One of the things I, as a music fan, really like is when I'm listening to something and I get pulled into it. I feel like I'm pulled into the music rather than pushed back by it. And so having something necessarily shouting at me makes me turn it down. And turning it down doesn't involve me as an active listener. It keeps me passive. And so I want to be an active listener. I, I, I'm a big fan of music and I want to be pulled into it. And I think the best practices back to that is uh, I found that the ones that pull me in more are ones that allow me to, uh, that have a sense of space and dynamics and transience and all those things that allow me to pull in full instruments. Pianos sound full, vocals sound full. There's, there's expression. You know, we, the, the human nature of music is, um, in, in a way, imperfect. We, we found a way in, the, in, in a lot of music is to, um, in my opinion, take away a lot of the things that are the human expression. Subtle variances in a piano chord that's got, you know, same chord, somebody plays it like this, but, but a different piano player will play the same chord with strength in different fingers, and so it sounds different. A guitar player, play the same guitar, play the same amp, play the same part, a different guitar player is going to have a different sound or a different feel. You know, a vocal, somebody who's expressing and getting from note to note, when we take away the things that make it human, we take away the thing that allows us to connect with it a little bit more. And this is, again, back to one of the things I think is really opportunistic about an immersive format is we've got the ability to keep more of those subtleties, those things that make artists unique, the things that make us want to hear more, the things that pull us into music. So uh, I think as, as far as that goes, back to the best practices is, you know, the further back we can go, stop for a minute, come back and realize this is totally different. This is a different animal. We're not trying to take all this information that was put in place like this and just spread it around. That's not the same thing as mixing properly in an immersive, immersive field. Mixing and mastering are two different ways to approach, two different tasks. There are two different um, objectives with it. Mixing is like, um, is balance is looking at the balance of instruments. How does this sound? How does this feel? So in a nutshell, the recording engineer is taking a sound or taking something and choosing the right microphone, choosing the place that this is going to be committed to, whether it's a tape machine or a, a disc, hard disc, or, or you know, a, a software station or, or something like that, committing a sound to something. The mixing engineer then is taking those sounds, the balancing how they present themselves. A little to the left, this one's kind of bright, this one's, dull, this one's quieter, this one, you know, whatever it happens to be to kind of get that. The perspective of a mastering engineer is not, it's not what is it, it's how is it. How does it present itself? How is it going to be enjoyed by the consumer, the, uh, by the fan on a variety of different playback mediums? We want translatability. There's the technical side, which is making sure that the very best version of the master is delivered to whoever's distributing it. If you're making vinyl, if you're making CDs, if you're making cassettes these days, if you're making, you know, high res downloads for, you know, high res download sites, if it's streaming, you know, and in this case, if it's immersive audio, what are the deliverables? What are the specifications that need to be made that allows the music to be at its best when it gets distributed? That's the technical side of it. The artistic side of it is really how does it present itself when you're listening on headphones or in a car or in a, in a, in a fantastic room like here at Sweetwater Studios, when you're listening in some, or a sound bar for somebody who's listening in their living room who has that. And these are all ways that people can enjoy immersive audio, but then how does it sound from system to system? And that translatability is, you know, is the aspect of what the mastering engineer on the artistic side is paying attention to. So they're, they're two totally different disciplines. You know, you may have two or three engineers on any given album, and how do those fit together? How does it become a body of work, not a collection of songs? Having somebody that is not tied to it, to be able to step back with that hat on and that perspective to be able to say, how does this present itself, not what is this? Can go through and listen to those different versions and do what's necessary to make it feel like, like you said, like a body of work. You want the listener to have an experience listening all the way through it as a, 
you know, as a complete program, as an album. Same thing with volume. You may want the volumes to be similar throughout. You may want them, like you may want to have dynamic changes through them. You may have soft ballads and big rockers and dense things and open, very, you know, sparse open pieces. And how does it present itself? So I think that they're, they're two different, very, very different aspects of engineering. And I think they should main, they should definitely be um, both equally important and should be maintained with the perspective of what each one is trying to accomplish. With mastering in immersive audio, we have so many more opportunities for problems in the deliverables, phase relationships between speakers. People are getting a handle on what mixing really is in that and to the question of, you know, what's working. As we're figuring these things out, we're also making a lot of mistakes, you know, and it's great to have a second set of ears in a in a tuned environment, and I mean tuned in a sense of a known quantity of this is how the room presents itself, to be able to make those observations. A, a lot of what this is in this stage for me with mastering is hearing what somebody is doing and being able to go back to the mix engineer, consultation. This is what I heard, and if you can adjust this in here, then I don't have to potentially change something that's coming out of this speaker only that throws the reverb balance off. If you can deal with this instrument or this object or don't touch a thing, you know, the, the, the space is great or the rears are too loud or however it, however it happens to be, you know, there's that opportunity for dialogue, which I think is huge. And it helps the mixer then understand more what they're doing in their space. But that's what we've been doing in the mastering world in stereo for decades and decades is, giving feedback to the mix engineer on what's coming out of their room. If something's coming out, you know, very uh, bass heavy and it's consistent through all of the tracks, it may be a system that there, it might be, uh, you know, uh, uh, something that their room has a particular lack of frequencies in an area that they're now making the decision to put all of those sound, you know, to, to bump up those frequencies because it sounds good to them there, but it won't translate to the rest of the world. So then I, you know, as a mastering engineer, then being able to go back and say, hey, I'm hearing this across the board with what you're doing. If you can ease this back, or you may want to look at the tuning of your room or, uh, or what your, your speaker placement or any of those kinds of things, it actually helps them to be better engineers for their other clients as well and moving forward. In the mastering world, same thing. Unfortunately, at the moment, there's not as many opportunities to hear immersive audio in that realm. For example, we used to, you know, you do a mix and you pop it on a cassette or something and you go out to the car and you listen to it. It's not quite possible at the moment. We have, and unfortunately, as we're figuring this out, there's a handful of different ways to even just to listen to on headphones. Listening on headphones is, is also a very personal experience. Some people like open ear headphones, some people like closed ear headphones, some have, you know, crammed in their ears. Sometimes they're little guys, sometimes they're big ones, sometimes they, you know, it's, it's kind of all over the place. And then when we get into spatial audio, immersive audio, trying to figure out where the localization happens, our brains process differently. And we're talking about HRTFs and we're talking about ways to be able to personalize the listening experience to the unique listener. But those are still coming online and becoming more common and, and uh, you know, um, in the professional world, something very, very talked about, but, you know, kind of oblivious in the consumer world for the most part. And so we have an education standpoint on that as well. But there's a whole lot of opportunity to be able to have, a, have somebody else with an unbiased opinion be, a, be an objective listener and say, here's how this is and here's how this is going to present itself. So I, I believe very strongly in the need for mastering of immersive audio. Uh, for that very reason, if this is going to succeed as a format, it has to be something, and, and I say format as in not necessarily one of these specific formats, but in a three-dimensional space, that this is, you know, for the consumers, I mean, consumers are pretty, pretty binary. They either like it or they don't. <laughs> you know, it's pretty straightforward. And if you want them to like it, you've got to do something that engages them. And if it's sort of subpar or just thrown together and not quite, you know, to the best of the artist's intent, they're gonna go back to the stereo and this won't really work as a format moving forward. So the very best thing we can do is to put out the very best we can. There are so many amazingly creative, talented people in this world. And I would love to see what they do with a sense of space and being able to make compositions. I'm just tickled to be a part of this record and working with Kenny. I think that you know he's just an, an unbelievably talented musician. I've been listening to him and watching him for decades, for a, a really long time and to, it's a, 
an amazing and a fantastic band, just some unbelievable players and the compositions, the, the, the soul that comes out through the playing, just the fire that is part of, bar, part of his music. What I hope to get out of this is just to help turn more people on into getting into the, like I said, being pulled into the music a little bit more. We're, you know, we're used to this paradigm of hearing things come out like this and it's powerful. But going to a show, you're catching all of this. You're, it's, the, it's everything that envelops you as a fan and as a listener and as somebody, you know, I, I would say, you know, I'm also diagnostic. I can't help it that I want to learn. I want to listen in and go, here's what the keyboard player's doing. Here's what the bass player's doing. Here's, listen to this drum rhythm, like all of this stuff. Listen to vocals, like power and vocals. And just hearing all, all of that is, is so amazing in that world. My hope with this is to recreate that same sense of just jaw-dropping awesomeness, you know, for somebody who's listening in an, in past a two-channel playback and in an immersive field. Whether they're listening on headphones or whether they get to listen on speakers like this and whether they get to experience it in this form, you know, like as I said, I think as we move forward, this will be more of a more common listening environment. Again, whether it's soundbar or, or, or something external rather than speakers, it's also an opportunity to experience it for me. I grew up listening to music with other people. A speaker system or sitting in a room with somebody and listening to music, there's a social aspect to it. And that social aspect is also learning. Hey, did you hear that part? Check this out. This is really cool. No, I wasn't. I was listening to that. Let's go back. Okay, cool. And you get to turn people onto records. You get to have the dialogue. And I think it elevates not only the fanness, but the understanding of what the artist is trying to get across. And my hope with this is to help people experience together the, the, you know, the awesomeness that comes out, you know, through the music. And like I said, the, not only just the compositions, but the, uh, um, you know, the art of the performance and what everybody brings to the table and how it just comes together so well. And again, that's, that socialness to me is, it's why we go to shows. It's why we experience music live. Getting it out in this world, hearing the different pieces, hearing the guitar parts do their part, hearing the rhythms, the you know, horns back and forth from the keyboards and how they're having a dialogue and a conversation comes out so much more in this world than it does when you're trying to just keep it together out of two speakers that, you know, my big hope is to, is to let people hear exactly more into what's going on and uh, experience their art and craft. It's just. Is fantastic. I do want to say that the you know the team here is fantastic. I mean, this is an amazing facility, and I'm I'm just blown away by you know the the capabilities, the resources, uh, all of the people I've worked with and and been in communication with here have just been just spot on and awesome. And it helps again with that. You don't have to worry about anything. Everything's being you know everything is is taken care of, so you can focus on why you're here. And so the fact that there are two rooms, two studios, well, there's more than two studios here, but the two that we're using to be able to, to do this are in proximity as well, uh, with two different intents and still interaction, which makes it just, you know, fabulous and fun.